But anyway, with, with no further ado, uh, Edwin. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for this kind presentation. Uh, introduction, I am extremely honored to be for the first time in my life with my wife here in Minneapolis. So it's a joyous occasion for us. Secondly, it's extremely joyous to be for the first time in front of a live audience. Uh, today with Sheer, I was for the first time in a classroom, uh, which was strange, I have to say. After 40 years of teaching, it became like a new experience, so it's uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you, Daniel, also for um, sparing me the time of thanking all the individuals at the Center for Jewish Studies and the other sponsoring institutions for their amazing uh, help to make our trip uh, here possible and to organizing all these events and for the wonderful food we have been having uh, today uh, and in the coming days. So this um, presentation was uh, originally intended uh, to be as a sort of public introduction to the conference so remember this lecture very well because you have to hold it in the memory until November when the conference is going to happen and hopefully we will be back in uh, Minneapolis, we will see. So uh, it's just to give you um, a taste of the subject of uh, Pute. Now, you can imagine that the subject is overwhelmingly vast and large uh, I will divide this presentation, which I designed specially for you. It's the first time I'm trying to do this in, in, uh, in, in one introductory lecture, to cover uh, the entire uh, journey that Piut made from the pulpit to the stage. Uh, the first part will be a little bit theoretical, historical, I usually uh, try to dedicate something like at least one third of my time to listening to music. So we are going to listen to music, uh, many types of music, and we are going also to watch a couple of videos too. So I hope uh, you enjoy. And I always open the, uh, my lecture with music, so let's open with music. Uh, Probably some of you know this song. Probably some of you will recognize the voice singing. I would just say that this to put us in the mood of Passover. Passover is coming. So this beauty is related to uh, Passover. If we have time at the end, if we have time, I will teach you how to sing it so that you can Forget about my lecture, but remember a song, which is more important. So, uh, 
I, first of all, I apologize that many of this music, I have to stop them in the middle because we don't have enough time to hear the whole songs. Uh, what is Piut? So I go like every one today to Professor Wikipedia, which is what most people will do if they don't know what Piut is. We get some information, a Jewish liturgical poem. I can agree with that. Usually designated to be sung, chanted, and recited. I can agree with that. Putin have been written since temple times. Mm. Not so sure. Most Putin are in Hebrew or Aramaic. I am glad whoever edited this that put most. There are also Putin in other Jewish languages. Most follow some poetic scheme, such an acrostic following the order of the Hebrew alphabet or spelling the name of the author, we will see an example. Again, not all of you team cover all this. So be careful with Wikipedia. It has a lot of information, but it's better to go to a real professor. So I'm quoting here my uh, colleague from Tel Aviv University and collaborator of many years, Professor Tova Beheri. Uh, team, she says, is the Hebrew term for liturgical poetry that embellishes the public recitation of statutory prayers. This is very important, as you will see. It's recited in the synagogue by the chazan, by the presenter. A substitute for most of the fixed versions of the obligatory prayers. You will see how important this is too. And then, finally, the Pute introduces variety. In this case, through artistic, poetic expression to the established prayers. So the bottom line is that, as you will see, Pute creates a situation where prayer can be changed. And this is very pertinent to our times. A little bit about the history very quickly. Piut starts for a fact, as we know it in late antiquity. In Byzantium, what was the area that Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, found itself uh, in later Roman times when the empire became Christian. Up to the Arab conquest, okay, that was the period, the formative period of Piut, what is called in research the classical Piut. The classical Piut continued its life and developed even much further in Babylonia, what is today Iraq, most particularly around the areas uh, where the J great Jewish academies were and in Baghdad. Baghdad, remember, became the capital, the cultural capital, of the uh, Arab Empire, the new Arab Empire. Again, Piut brings to a variable liturgy by the cantor, and in my humble opinion, Piut is the gate through which music enters the synagogue. Piut, as we will see, was not always welcomed by rabbinical authorities, uh, some of the Babylonian geonim, the leaders of the world Jewish community at that time, uh, had certain reservations, but they have to give up to popular practice. That is to say, the development of Piut has to do also with a, a process going from down up and not from up down. The Middle Ages, uh, the Piut reaches what is usually called a golden age, but starts to develop very different now on the western part of the world, Spain and Ashkenaz, which is Germany uh, of today, and France, uh, northeast France, north, uh, southeast France. The Ashkenazi Piut develops into many uh, complex styles that continue the classical Piut with uh, a language that 
becomes more and more difficult to understand. It's a language based with, to uh, allusions to the Bible and to rabbinical traditions with clever but very artificial grammatical constructions. In Spain, on the other hand, the poets rejected the classical pute in favor of a much more lyrical biblical language. And this is very important, they introduced metrics to the poetry based on the Arabic system of metrics. I cannot go into details, but this is a totally new revolutionary way of creating Hebrew uh, poetry. At this time too, as we advance in the Middle Ages, there is a liturgical standardization that leads to local selections of pew teams. So here we have the prayer books bifurcating into different directions with different selections of pew team in Ashkenaz and in uh, Sepharad, but eventually bifurcating into sub-traditions, like the Sephardic tradition in North Africa is different from the one in the Ottoman Empire towards the 16th century, the Yemenite uh, tradition is totally different, the Iraqi, etc. I'm not going too fast, I hope, because this is a crash course, okay? Against Pute. So the opposition to Pute has many stages. One of the main uh, authorities who frown upon Pute is Maimonides, no less and his voice was heard. Later on, in the 16th century, in Eretz Israel, the Kabbalists, leading, lead, led by the Ariya Kadosh, the Rabbi Ishak Luri Ashkenazi, the great inspiration of Kabbalah in the 16th century, of, um, if I may say, early modern Kabbalah, he was also very... Um, reserved regarding uh, the Pute, particularly because the Pute team, these additions, interfered with the hidden intentions of the fixed liturgy. The fixed liturgy for the Kabbalists had already an embedded secret meaning that to introduce a text in the middle cut the, the real intentions, the secret intentions of prayer. That's how we uh, end up with this opposition. Pewtim then start to be removed to the fringes of the normative liturgy so that they won't bother you in the middle. You put them at the very beginning or at the very end and you know the famous Pewtim, Adon Olam, Igdal, they're all either at the beginning or at the end. Later on, the reform movement in Germany, we are now in the 19th century. I'm sorry I'm moving every minute, three, four centuries forward. Uh, expurgated Pewtim as later artificial accretions that are irrelevant and intelligible to modern Ashkenazi Jews, okay? But basically to all modern Jews. Uh, this is one of the staples of the reform movement, the removal of most of the Pew team as irrelevant to uh, modernizing Judaism. But even Orthodox communities curtailed some Pew team simply because the text of the liturgy grew to such an extent that the liturgy became unbearable long. And why it became long? Because the singing of the pew started to develop more and more. The more the cantor invests musically on one pew, you cannot have them all. So here you have what I call the economy of the Jewish liturgy, too much music, you have to, to cut in other parts. I won't go now into that, but that's a very important issue. And I want to finally quote a dear colleague from Duke University, Professor Laura Lieber, one of the authorities on Pute in this country. And she says, the irony, however, lies in the fact that the Pute was itself a sort of liturgical reform where early generations of Jews were unable to change the statutory service itself, Putin allowed for an imaginative embellishment of that service. Imagine if you went to shul in Baghdad in the ninth century, every Shabbos you will have a different set of prayers. It sounds like 
quite modern, something that we forgot. That's what Piud has done. But remember, at a certain stage, the liturgy is frozen, and that's the end of the story. My last point in this crushing theoretical introduction, theoretical historical, the Piud comeback, or I would say Piud bouncing back. The removal of Piotim from the statutory liturgy, liturgy never hampered religious poetical creativity. So even if there was an opposition to Piot, the poets continue to create poetry. Where do you perform the poetry? We have the phenomenon of the paraliturgical Piot. Piot that is performed in different devotional contexts that emerge in Judaism aside of the liturgy or expanding all their practices. For example, the selichot, the services leading to the yamim noraim and during the yamim noraim, early morning, okay, if you come to Jerusalem, you can come, get up at 3, 4 in the morning, and you will have these very long services with many pew team because the Selichot is a service that was created after the statutory uh, uh, liturgy was in place. Kinot, for, particularly for Tisha B'Av, for the ninth of Av, we have hundreds of new Kinot composed because the recitation of the Kinot was also a paraliturgical event added to the liturgy. The Zemirot, you all sing, team after this, uh, the festive Sabbath or holiday meal. So that offered another, uh, in this case, domestic setting for the singing of Piyotim. Piyotim are also sung in weddings in Brit Mila. So we have Piyotim for Brit Mila. We have Piyotim for weddings. And we have Bakashot. This is a very important development of the Piyot in the Middle East and around the Mediterranean. People get up in the middle of the night in the Sabbath to recite paraliturgical poems set to the most beautiful music through the winter seasons, usually. This is, again, what I call uh, uh, devotional context that it's something that you do because you really want to do. Not because Allah tells you you have to pray in the morning these prayers. You go there on your own uh, initiative. Uh, and, of, and therefore, the most important uh, uh, aspect of the paraliturgical piyut is music. This is already a piyut composed for music, developed through music, and the events in which they are recited, whether this is a wedding or a singing of Bakashod, is a purely musical event. So, so far for the introduction. And right now we are going, I will going to take you to two or three different stages in the piyut, and we are going to learn how a piyut is made and how it is performed. Let me start with something that perhaps you didn't think in the framework of Piut, let's hear this recording.
Again, apologize for cutting. It's a very beautiful recording from Park Avenue Synagogue. Why Avinu Malkein? How is a new poetical prayer created? How we move from private to congregational expression? So we go back to the Talmud. That's where we have the first notice about Avinu Malkeinu, one of the oldest stratum of what we can call piyut, of an embellishment, of a poetical embellishment of the prayer. And in uh, the Talmud, we have a story, I, it's in Hebrew, but I will translate for you, about Rabbi Eliezer, that in the synagogue went to, to pray, and he said 24 blessings, and he was not answered by the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbi Akiva, when to the podium, okay, imagine Rabbi Eliezer comes, 24 blessings, nothing works. We still don't know what, what's not working. Rabbi Akiva come and he says, Avinu Malkeinu, en lanu melech et ela ata. Avinu Malkeinu, we have no other king but you. Ve'yarduk shamim. And it rained. They were playing for rain. So the power of the prayer Avinu Malkeinu is embedded in this uh, quotation from the Talmud, which already tells us that this prayer existed in Talmudic times, this edition. Look what happened with Rashi, roughly a thousand years after. Regilim Lomar, that is, we are used to say Avinu Malkeinu, now it's a fact, it's part of the liturgy. Miemei Rabbi Akiva, from the times of Rabbi Akiva, as we learn from the Talmud, that is written, Avinu Malkeinu Chatanu Lefanecha, we have seen before you. So Rashi knows the Talmud very well, but he is already quoting not what is written in the Talmud, but what he recites in his synagogue. The Yarduk Shamim and it rained. The Kesharau Shenanu Bat Fila, and when they learn that this prayer is so powerful, Osifu Alea Miyom Midei Yom Beyom Bekavuam Liamei Chiba, they 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 added to it, they expanded it, and they turned that into a daily prayer for the days of repentance. Where does Rashi is quoting? He's quoting from the oldest versions that we have of the prayer book, the Seder Amram Gaon, from Babylonia, 9th century. And you have the Avinu Malkeinu, Chatanu Lefanecha, the very beginning, that's what Rashi has in mind. We also have in this Avinu Malkeinu, this very first version, which is one of many versions of Avinu Malkeinu, our first prayer against the pandemic. Already then, Atzor Magefa Min Achalatecha, okay? Avoid the pandemic from your lands. And at the very end, we have the phrase of Avinu Malkeinu that all of you know, and that perhaps we are going to sing together in a, in a, um, during this lecture, Asei Manu Tzedaka Veoshienu made Tzedaka with us and bring us salvation. And then Avinu Malkeinu, I won't go into these uh, details, expanded and expanded that in different traditions and in different liturgical contexts it has different uh, versions. But what it stays as a fixed form is the approaching of the person praying, the individual praying, Avinu Malkeinu addressing God as our Father, our King. What happened to Avinu Malkeinu when it grows tremendously? And we have, some communities have 24 Avinu Malkeinu, some have even more. You cannot sing all the Avinu Malkeinu with an extended melody. The service will never end. So you sing only two phrases, or four. That's what we sing in the synagogue today. Music has its own agenda, and the rest we say it very, very fast. Okay, so that we can pay it for the time we are consuming with the music. 
And what we usually sing is, Avinu malkeinu, haneinu, benaneinu, ki eim banu maasim, ase, imanu tzedaka v'chesed v'yoshienu. That's what most particularly Ashkenazi synagogues say. So, with this in mind, let me play for you one of the greatest cantors of the Ottoman, late Ottoman Empire, Rabbi Isaac Algazi, in a recording made in Istanbul in the 1920s. This is a Turkish Avinu Malkeinu. Let's listen to it. This is a commercial recording, so we have instrumental accompaniment. This is an oud player, and the player is not Jewish, he's a Greek player. Imagine performing the 24 times the Avinu Malkeinu like that. This is one of the great voices. He was one of the great singers of Turkey at his time. And here you have an extremely artistic elaboration of Avinu Malkeinu into a musical composition. So you see, I bring you some extremes of the evolution of this ancient prayer that accompanies us our liturgy for at least, at least 1,500 years. Not only the Sephardim embellish the Vinu Malkeinu, but I bring you an interesting recording, also to plug in the work of the institute that I direct in Jerusalem of the Jewish Music Research Center. We publish this uh, uh, amazing book which uh, has to do with the uh, legacy of cantor Meyer Levy of Esslingen. Esslingen is a small town near, to, near Stuttgart in Bavaria and uh, cantor Levy prepared for his students the entire Jewish liturgy musical notation. You have an example of his manuscript and look how the music is written. It's written from right to left so that the Hebrew text can be uh, adapted. And this is before the Zionists started to write music from right to left. So we uh, edited all this music from left to right so that it can be read uh, and, and published in this book, edited by my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg. And we recorded the liturgy as it was performed in Germany 150 years ago. Here is an Avinu Malkeinu. Notice what happened to this one. An old Ashkenazi Avinu Malkeinu.
So what we have is an expansion of Avinu Melkeinu, exactly like what Algazi does, except that here the extension is vocalized. La, 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 etc., etc. So we have an entire symphony now made out of Avinu Melkeinu, and these are two examples out of so many. Which Avinu Melkeinu you know? Can you sing it for me? Avinu Malkenu. Someone doesn't know this song? Yeah, you know this song. Now, you may think this is a very ancient song. Well, let me tell you that one of the, the oldest versions we know of this melody is from 1932. We have no notice of the melody before that. Perhaps it existed as a traditional new one. And look what happened to the piyut in the 20th century. One of the earliest appearances of this Avinu Malkeno with the melody that we know is in 1935 in this book of Hebrew songs uh, published by the Zionist movement in Germany in 1935. Think about that, what meant to produce this in 1935. All the songs appear with musical notation. Of course, in Germany, every educated person knows how to read music. And Avinu Malkeno appears not even among the religious songs. It appears among the lyrical songs, and uh, it has uh, the text. It also has, I won't go now into musicology, but it has a melodic variant that is different from what we sing today, so it's a little bit old uh, version. And they used uh, these uh, uh, prayers and putim to teach Hebrew to the, to the uh, young people. So you have German translations of the difficult words from the song. So, you, if you know how to read music, every note that we sing is written in this song. So, here I just bring you a little bit also of our research techniques, our resources, how can we know how old the melody is, what are the means that we have to write uh, the history of the period. Let me take something from the Middle Ages, and I'm sorry I move extremely fast. This is a period, Shofet Kol Aretz, which I'm bringing, first of all, because it's exemplary of so many phenomena of the period in what I call the golden age of period. It be, and also because it's one of the few piyutim that is performed assiduously by both Ashkenazi and Sephardim. And we even don't know the identity of the poem, of the author of the poem, except the name. His first name was Shlomo. And you can see his name uh, uh, in the first letters of every stanza, Shin Lamet Memhei Shlomo. In many, if you go to Wikipedia, they will tell you that this is Shlomo Ibn Gvirol. No. Okay, we have no uh, way to know exactly who this Shlomo was. And probably the Piut was created in Provence, which is in between Spain and Ashkenaz. Okay? Uh, there are a lot of colors there. Uh, I will tell you what it is. By the way, in the Yemenite prayer books, this poem is expanded by additional stanzas. So you see that sometimes an existing piyut gets additions by other poets which take the frame of the original and add new stanzas. Uh, here we have a translation. I don't have time to talk about translations of piyutim. Translating piyutim to any language, let alone to English, is not an easy task. And um, uh, Mrs. Alice Lucas was an British Jewish intellectual who translated many piyutim uh, from the classical period. Uh, and you can see her uh, old-fashioned uh, English, but it's very beautiful because she tried to uh, preserve the uh, uh, rhyme of the original Hebrew. Not the sound of the rhyme, but the positioning of the rhymes. Uh, and um, uh, it's very beautiful uh, translation. So, what we have here in the colors, you see the red color is the main uh, rhyme of the, the poem. 
uh, this main rhyme uh, uh, rhymes with what it's uh, in purple, and purple is the refrain. That's what the congregation sings. So the cantor sings all the lines, and the purple line is the last line of the first stanza, and that becomes the refrain. The original poem was not intended to be like that. Here you see, again, the people invented the refrain by turning the last line into a refrain, and therefore we have today uh, a chorus, if you want. Uh, the green is the internal rhyme of each stanza that changes in each stanza, and the third line of each stanza, you can see in the middle, you have the rhyme of the first two lines in, in green, and then the last word of the third line is always tamid, the same word that ends the, uh, the um, last line of the first answer. If you're confused, don't worry about it. It's, it's a very, uh, you need to study this uh, quite a lot, but you can see here again how the rhyme uh, of uh, um, uh, middle stanza goes, ron, 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 tamid, okay, and then the congregation recites the refrain. Uh, also important in this uh, poem, this is a poem which has already a meter, it's metered, and every half uh, line has six syllables, uh, syllabic grammatical, I cannot even try to explain to you what that means in Hebrew, but this is very special type of, uh, of, um, of uh, meter, all six, 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 six. Sources for the poem. So the poet, since, as I told you in the medieval period, they draw their resources from the Bible. So Shofet Kol Aretz, from where it's taken, it's taken from Bereshit from Genesis, chapter 18, Ashufet kol aretz lo mishpat. This is one of the most famous phrases in the Bible. Who is saying these words? Abraham, okay? Abraham is telling God, Shufet kol aretz, uh, judge of all the universe, of all her, uh, uh, her earth, uh, how can not do justice with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's, uh, that's one line of... Uh, the other idea of the piyut appears in the Talmud, that tefilot keneget temidim tikunam, that is to say that the prayers were instituted instead of the, of the perpetual sacrifices of the temple. And this is what our poem is teaching. So... Uh, what uh, we have is that the refrain is taken from another verse. I translated this into English for you. So within the general, very technical description of sacrifices, there is this sentence. You are to present this in addition to the regular morning burn offering. And that phrase is extricated from the biblical text that gets a new meaning in the new poem. This is how Piut elaborates on, on concepts and on phrases and parts of verses from the Bible to get them into a new meaning. The congregation knows this text in the original context and they can recontextualize in the framework of Pew. I won't go now into this. Let me tell you that we have a melody for this Pew in the most unexpected source that you can imagine. This is the Estropoetico Armonico. This is a collection of uh, psalms for the church. One of the most famous Baroque composers from Italy, he wanted to base his psalms for the synagogue in the most um, um, authentic uh, way who has the authentic music of the sons of David, the Jews. He went to the Jewish ghetto and collected Jewish, traditional Jewish melodies, and he set them up like this. With the Hebrew text, he, he had connections to the Jewish community. Again, from right to left, this is all the ecclesiastical writing in Hebrew. 
and we can translate that into normal musical notation and we can hear. And I won't play you uh, a lot of this because we don't have the time, but just to hear the original um, uh, ecclesiastical version. One of the wonders of research when you discover that oral tradition maintain a melody that we have documented 200 years ago, that gives you faith that many other aspects of the Jewish oral tradition are of extreme antiquity. Let's listen to a version from Mr. Heller from Venice singing in Hebrew. So here you have the oral tradition preserving the main framework of this ancient melody for Shofet Kolaris, this old Ashkenazi melody preserved only uh, uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, just to show you that we also have a very ancient Sephardic version from the Portuguese community in London. This very important book, uh, The Liturgy of the Spanish Portuguese Jews in Musical Notation, and look how Shofet looks. This way of writing music is very unusual for the 19th century. If you know something about music, there are no bars here. So the music is a very long recitative without clear rhythm, without clear beat. And we have a wonderful performance by my dear friend, cantor Daniel Halfon, who studied in London in his youth. Then he was cantor in New York, and today is cantor in Jerusalem. So very ancient Spanish-Portuguese melody. And to honor you, Daniel, I cannot give a lecture without playing a Moroccan example. So we have here the Moroccan Shofet Kolaretz, and in a very interesting video, this shows how technology has revolutionized research. 
As an ethnographer, I can now be in places that I could never be in physically, and they were documented. So here you have an historical visit of Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, the chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel then, to a Moroccan synagogue in uh, Ashdod, in southern Israel. And what you have here is a performance of the pute as a musical, and if I may even say entertainment, in between the words of the rabbis, they put a singer singing pute outside the context of the liturgy as an artistic performance. So now we are really on the stage, not already on the pulpit, but on the stage. What is even more fascinating, musically speaking, he's accompanied by an ensemble of Iraqi Jewish musicians. And regretfully, I cannot go back 30 years ago and ask why this decision to put the Moroccan singer with the best Iraqi Jewish musicians, but the result is very interesting. Just, again, a little taste. Here you have um, a fascinating multicultural encounter in an Israeli synagogue. Also, that synagogue today will look much more blacker, much more black people dressed than what they look here 30 years ago. Um, and musicologically speaking, there is a connection between the Portuguese version that we heard from London and the Moroccan version. And this is Whoever knows a little bit of history and the relationships between London and Morocco won't be surprised. But since we have the musical notation from the early 19th century, we can already assume that this, again, is a very old tune for this very old piut. And this is my uh, last example of Shofet, uh, a Yemenite uh, popular song. This is already a pop song religious in content that incorporates Shofet as part of the song. Listen to it and I hope you enjoy it. Shaha, 
אפשר לא עולה אתה תומך. וכולם עכשיו מתפללים ליל העליון אדון העולמי מנגינה שלו שלא אשכח כל נדרי השגף לכהלי נפתחים שמיים החיים בבית הכנסת הישר בניך עבוד אחור היום למקדוש אחור יבוא יום סוחרים סדגות אבום אדונו יעלה המחיום אדום תזכור נגד אדוני תומי אשר לעולה ותומית. I'm sorry I have to cut. Uh, towards the end, uh, my last example will be from the early modern period, and actually from the modern one. And this is an occasion to bring one of my main heroes in the period history, which we mentioned today in class, Rabbi Israel Najara. You see the poet has his name of one of the streets of Jerusalem, so he's very well recognized, and there are many other streets in other cities of Israel that has his name. Rabbi Najara, who lived uh, around 1550 to 1625, um, mostly in Syria, in Damascus. Uh, later in his life, he was the rabbi of the Gaza Strip. There was a community in Gaza, and he was the rabbi there, one of the great poets. You can see here, uh, uh, combining uh, uh, technology with the Piyut, uh, one page dedicated to Rabbi Israel Najara in the famous Piyut website, uh, we internet website created for the diffusion uh, and uh, documentation of the Piyut. He has a very special place there. Uh, his most famous song you all know, but most people don't know that he wrote the song. So it's time to give Rabbi Israel Najara the copyrights on the song Ya Ribon Olam that we all sing on the Sabbath table. That's one of his most famous songs. You see that the song was so famous that it was even uh, arranged for the United Nations uh, written uh, poem of an ancient Hebrew prayer by Israel Najara of Palestine. Okay? Written in the 16th century. Here you have the original uh, book where Yari Bonolam appears, just showing you a little bit how also the Piyut appears in print and in press. Uh, this is the introduction to uh, the Rabbi Israel Najara's uh, published uh, edition of poems. Uh, the uh, poems were published three times during his lifetime. So the demand for his poetry, for his modern, early modern poetry, was just overwhelming. Tell me how many modern poets of our time have their books published in three editions in their lifetimes. Think about that. We're, there was hardly a Hebrew press at the time, okay? So that tells about the power of this literature and the demand by the public. In the introduction to the, uh, to the book, Rabbi Israel Najala writes something very interesting. He said, the public wants to sing the melodies that they love from the non-Jews. And they try to adapt texts to those melodies, and they don't do a good job because they are not good poets. I am bringing you now the best poetry adapted to the best music of the time. And the best music of the time is music that re belongs to the area where he uh, creates. One, the Ottoman Empire, so Turkish music, Arabic music, because he's living in the Arabic lands of the Ottoman Empire, Spanish music, because his family is from Spain. So he also employs melodies in Judeo-Spanish. And all this comes in the book, in this form. This is Yarri Bonolam, the first 
uh, addition you have uh, to your right, uh, a very bad edition in Sfat. This was a very primitive Hebrew press. The Venice version of a few years later is much more beautiful. And you see that, uh, sorry, that uh, Rabbi Israel Najara, in the title to the poem, he writes to what melody he wants the Arribon Olam to be sung. He writes that this is a Arabic, uh, an Arabic song. And at the end, you have the word rust, okay? It's very difficult to see it, but it's right here. This is the name of an Arabic musical scale. So you have the musical scale, the ethnic proceeding of the melody, and the name of the melody. The melody, it's uh, uh, in the um, Venice version, Lachan Yarra Bis Salim Salimi. Oh my God, provide or make peace. This is the Arabic song. So you see, Ya Rabbi Salim, Ya Ribon Olam. So the Hebrew poetry, in a way, resounds with the Arabic language. The Arabic is embedded within the Hebrew language. And that's the, um, the um, technique that he used to compose uh, poetry. Uh, I think I will skip playing, uh, I have this beautiful Hasidic recording of Adon Olam, but we are running out of time. I will just finish with uh, Piut on the stage today. Uh, uh, th again, the, the Piut website. Uh, one of the most famous poems uh, by Rabbi Israel Najara today is Ya'ala, Ya'ala Boy Legani, my found, my found, come to my garden. It's a poem heavily uh, based on the Song of Songs, okay? And uh, what is interesting about this Ya'ala Ya'ala is that it was never published during the life of the poet. It's not included in his book, but it's a poem that he wrote later in his life and remained only in manuscript. And it was copied and recopied and recopied by all the singers, and it remained alive until the 21st century. So let me play Yala Yala. This was recorded again, interesting to see the stage. This is a Tikkun Shelel Oshana Raba in Tekoa in the in the um, West Bank or Judea, you pick the name. And uh, it is uh, um, a nightly vigil of the of the uh, night of uh, Oshana Raba. And it's the vigil is just a concert of Pew team. That's the vigil. Usually you study Torah and you recite prayers. In this case, the whole vigil is a big concert. And uh, let's just listen. <laughs> In this performance, what you have is a new arrangement of a traditional melody. So the archive comes outside into the stage. The people performing, none of them, this melody belongs to their tradition. So they, it's just learned. And they accompany themselves with instruments that belong to five different cultures. So what we have is a totally new product that is a result of the piyut coming into the stage. My last example is a beautiful performance of Yala, Yala by Rabbi Chaim Luke, one of the, we talk about him today in class, so here's an opportunity. And this is in a very, uh, um, very special production. Productions like this are rare because this was a very expensive 
um, staging of uh, Pew team. This is the traditional Moroccan version and uh, is performed by the New Jerusalem Orchestra in the Israel Festival. This was a commission performance by the Israel Festival. I think I will stop here because you told me one hour, so it's one hour. If you have patience, I have a little bit more, but I don't want to abuse your patience. So if it is a little bit late, uh, the bottom line is that Piut made this amazing journey, as we saw, from very private devotions into the largest possible stages in the most multicultural stage that you can imagine in terms of its sound. I hope that I provided you with some ideas about what Piut is. There is much more to say and certainly there is much more to listen, but I hope that now you can go back home and uh, just pick Shofet Kol Aretz and in YouTube you promise you that you will find an amazing amount of examples to enjoy and to listen. So thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for your attention. And thank you very much. Would, would you be willing if there anyone who might have any questions and just, if that's all right with you, and for Couple, couple more minutes if anyone has any. I can play just one more song and that's it. Okay? Yeah, let's hear some, something amazing, very beautiful, and you will see also how it works. So, another Piyut by Israel Najara. Uh, this one is very special. You can see here the original manuscript. This is his unpublished poetry. Okay? The song. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Ben Tavinu Liknot Bina Zinu. I will give you the English translation. It's based on a, uh, on a sentence from Ecclesiastes, okay? And you see that the melody he designed for that, it's written in Spanish, believe it or not. This is pure Spanish. Con el vino saniarea yo marido. And in another manuscript, we discover the continuation, Con el agua pasearé mala. This is an old Spanish um, uh, folk song in which the wife says to the husband, with wine, I will be okay. But if you give me water, I will be very mad at you. So the song is called in Spanish, La Borracha, the drunken one. And to this drunken song from the 16th century, Rabbi Israel Najara composed this amazing poem. And the poem, by the way, this is the Arabic, uh, the Turkish uh, uh, musical mode. You can see the name of the melody. And um, 
the poem uh, it's um, totally forgotten today <coughs> nobody remembers that but I found that one person remembered the melody of this song in Bulgaria one Sephardic Jew and this was printed in the anthology of Sephardic Hazanut by Isaac Levy in the late 1950s. I took the melody and we turned that into a new performance. And here you have the, uh, the performance, the magnificent translation of Laura Lieber for our hopefully forthcoming book on Israel Najara in English, the first book in English. And what is amazing about this song, about La Borracha, is that the song is like Had Gadia, like the Had Gadia of you in Passover. So in every stanza, the husband says to the wife, I will give you jewelry. And she says, no, I want wine, and don't give me anything else. I will give you the best clothes. No, I want wine, don't give you anything else. What Rabbi Najara writes, he says, you must understand to acquire understanding, give here. To acquire wisdom that gives its possessor life. And what is amazing is that the word Ba'ala means husband, which is marido in Spanish. So he took the original sense okay, of the song, but he turned it upside down. The most valuable asset is not the wine, but wisdom, following Ecclesiastes. And then he took from the Talmud, this is a really an amazing scholar, can only do that, all the possible material that can, you know, give you the sense of possession and wisdom is more important than crimson, than purple, than bronze, than silver, than gold. All these are Talmudic quotations. The tune taken from the only person who remember one tune for this song, and this is the revival with Eran Sur, one of the greatest uh, Israeli rockers, okay? And this is a production that I produced for the Oud Festival in 2009 called Original Najara, Najara Mekori in Hebrew, new versions of his poems based on research, based on research. You will be surprised, and I'm glad I'm finishing this because the music sounds like music from this area of the United States.
Thank, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I hope, hope we can all, you'll all be able to join us uh, tomorrow evening uh, at the University of Minnesota campus. Yep. So we'll get a... Yeah, it, but tomorrow is a single long. So tomorrow we are just going to skip this theory and just see and teach you a few few things. So you come. And we'll have the best musicians from New York. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Thank you all.